He is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning. Our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on Good Friday, but today, Easter Sunday, he has risen, resurrected from the dead. My name is Kevin. Welcome to New Community Worship. And I especially welcome those who are joining us for the first time, or possibly from a place far away from Newton, Mass. I invite you to stay connected with our new community family today and throughout the week. If you have not already done so, today, Easter Sunday, a day of new beginnings, is a perfect day to start. So join us later today at around 1145 to share and pray for each other. Or join us on Wednesday evenings also to share and pray with one another. Our small groups are also meeting online throughout the week. If you're interested, please contact Pastor Ken. His contact info can be found at bcec.net. Again, welcome. Our worship service today will start with greeting our Lord as we sing praises and prayers to him. It will be followed by a reading from scripture and a message from our pastor. Then we'll have a time to respond to God's message in offering and song, and then close with a benediction. Let us now join together to pray to our risen Lord. Lord, we worship you, for you are the glorious Lord who was raised from the dead. Scripture says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Yes, you, Jesus, have been raised, and by it we know you have your death successfully paid for all the sins of all of us who turn to you. You made us righteous in you. Our guilt and shame and fear is replaced with your amazing unconditional love in all our days from today to eternity. We praise you. And scripture says, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And also, he who raised the Lord, Jesus, will raise us also with Jesus. Yes, you are the first of many. We believe and look forward with great joy and anticipation to the day when we all will follow you, raised from the dead into heaven. We praise you. And scripture says, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. And you put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. O oh, Jesus, you have not only risen, but you are above all, you rule over all, and you are the all-supplying guide and head of your church here on earth. We trust you with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. For you love us so much that you gave up your perfect, sinless life on earth to make it so every day we have everything that is good for us for all eternity. Jesus, we love you. You are our joy and our treasure above all. You have risen. You are alive. In your name we pray. Amen. i 
Pastor Ken, and I'm one of the pastors here at BCEC, and are so glad that we can come together on this Easter Sunday. Uh, for the past few weeks since we've gone online, we have kind of, kind of foregone some of our usual traditions um, because of the limitations online, but I know some of us are joining us on Zoom, so this will enable us to be a little more interactive, and even if you're not on Zoom, uh, we want to do something that we typically do every week, and that is to pass the peace of Christ. And what that is, is it's reminding ourselves that as Christ died for us and Christ rose again, that he has offered us peace. And we're to offer peace to one another as well. And even though we're not physically with each other, uh, we could always do it with the people who are with us right now. Or if you're uh, on your own, maybe you can at this moment, we'll pause for a moment and, and maybe text somebody, call somebody, um, just just pass the peace of Christ. Give a Easter greeting to somebody. So we're going to do that in a moment. We're going to pause for maybe, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds or so to just pass the peace of Christ together. And so let's pause to do that and to remember what Christ did for us and to share that peace with one another. So let's do that for these next few moments. <music> Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. If you have a Bible, please join us in reading this together. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. 
But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you know, I'm a pretty big sports fan, and growing up, I watched this show uh, religiously called Sports Center. And on this show, uh, there's a broadcaster named uh, Dan Patrick, and he was famous for a catchphrase: "You can't stop him; you can only hope to contain him." And, and basically, he would say this whenever an athlete would go on this tear, like Michael Jordan scoring 55 points uh, and and just just being kind of unconscious. And so Dan Patrick would say can't stop him you can only hope to contain him and on this sunday morning if dan patrick was doing a play by play perhaps it would be appropriate as well that he would say you can't stop him you can only hope to contain him why because the tomb is empty jesus has risen from the dead he has conquered the grave so christ is risen and he is risen indeed and so how should this glorious day how should this glorious day give us hope especially when it feels like easter has been sidelined a little bit I mean, Easter is kind of like a Super Bowl for, for churches, right? You pull out all the stops to celebrate the risen king, right? And yet we find ourselves uh, kind of scattered in our homes, huddled perhaps around a TV or computer screen or even your phone. And it just, again, mind-blowing that something so small, something invisible to the eye can, can really cause so much disruption and stop us in our tracks. And so there may be a dissonance that you feel um, I might be in a suit and all, and that might seem familiar on, on a Easter morning. But, but other than that, um, you know, our experiences of Easter are, are drastically different from what we're experiencing right now. But I think it's all the more important for us to, to gather as a community, even if it's online, uh, to perhaps reimagine or, or perhaps to reorient uh, to the idea of, of new life and what that looks like in times like these. If you really think about the Easter story, it's actually not all that different in the sense that it's not quite the festive and the celebratory rah-rah kind of experience that we're perhaps more familiar with now. But the disciples, if you think about it, were still in a state of confusion and, and disillusionment. They're still wrapping their minds and still processing the events and the gruesome events of, of, of Good Friday. I mean, there's something so gruesome about that. It's just hard to forget it. And then for three days later, even though it was probably a three, uh, even though there were probably very long days, um, despite that, the fact that Jesus rose again, that it's still again jarring and, and still something that that they're still trying to comprehend. They're still trying to feel out the implications of what is going on. Now, again, Jesus rose and he started making appearances to his uh, disciples and. And there were multiple attempts uh, to contain this news. Uh, there are people who, who, who didn't want this news to continue to perpetuate. There are, there are leaders and religious establishment who tried their best to, to either uh, to stop or contain or change the narrative of what was actually going on. 
And although the church was kind of reorienting to this new reality and these new possibilities, there's something bubbling up. There's something brewing within them. Uh, it, it, it's kind of like this, a, a bottle of soda. I don't know if you ever you know, purposely or by accident sh have shaken a, a bottle of, of, of soda and, and see the bubbles form. There's something brewing. There's something bubbling up. And, and all it takes is just a little crack, a little opening for it just to, for everything just, just to spill out. All the bubbling just kind of spills out in the open, right? And so and that's basically what's kind of happening here in these early days, right after the resurrection. There's something brewing. There's something bubbling up. And, and the opening was the Holy Spirit coming down. And, and the Holy Spirit just caused it to bubble up to the point where it was just spilling all over. And, and no matter how much you try to contain it, no matter how much you try to put a cap on it, there's just no way. There's no possible way for the Spirit of God, the movement of God, to be contained or stopped. People were sharing the story. People were sharing their lives in, in new and unusual ways. People were generous and sacrificial. People were teaching about who Jesus was. They were ministering in his name. They were doing miracles as if Je uh, just as Jesus was doing. And so the church was born out of just this bubbling up of the Holy Spirit. Again, there are people who were, who were trying to desperately stop uh, the, the church, to contain the church from bubbling up further. They're trying to put a cap on it. And so here in, in Acts chapter 4, we see an example of how religious leaders were trying to, to kind of figure out how to, to kind of put an end to this. And so in chapter 4, we see um, an example of how they try to, again, limit and try to, try to reverse this, this momentum and so they're greatly annoyed that Peter was, was teaching and, and proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead. And so they arrest them, hoping to put the fear of God in them. And, and they plan to put him in on trial. And so you think the church would be kind of freaked out by G, uh, Peter's arrest. Uh, you think that they would perhaps shirk back a little bit and say, maybe this is a little out of hand, all this bubbling up. Maybe we need to kind of slow down a bit. But in chapter 4, verse 4, we, we, we see here that that we see the opposite in fact we see um, all those who heard the word believe the number of men came to about 5,000 um, despite the opposition the church continued to grow the more they try to shake up the church the more they began to spill out the more they bubbled over and so the next day the rulers and, and, and the scribes gathered in Jerusalem and these are all like the big names right all these big names, those, those intimidating these names, those people who had clout, those people who had authority, people who, 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 can, who could have the power to, to determine people's lives. And, and so they were conducting a trial of Peter and his disciples. And in an intimidating tone, they, 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 they asked this question, uh, by what power or by what name did you do this? And now they don't really want to know. Basically, behind that question is, who do you think you are? We're the ones who call the shots. We're the one with power and authority. Who are you? By, by what authority do you have to do this, right? Who do you think you are? Now, how would Peter respond to this? Would he deny everything like he did on the night when Jesus was crucified? When a, a servant girl um, interrogated him and said, hey, don't you belong to this to this Galilean? And, and, and Peter denied Jesus three times and, and he and he ran away and essentially abandoned Jesus. And so what's the difference between then and now? How would Peter respond? What enabled him to, to respond in the way that he did? And so if you were with us last week, we, we saw that Jesus promised that it was actually better for him to, to, to the disciples' advantage for him to leave so that the Spirit, the Helper, would come. And so the Holy Spirit did come in Acts chapter 2. The Pentecost, uh, the Holy Spirit descended upon the church, and that's when the bubbling up start, really started to take shape. That's when things really started to, uh, the, the, the church was really being shaken up and, and, and spilling over into the streets and into people's homes, and, and people were proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And so the Helper, the, good, the, the Holy Spirit, was behind all this bubbling up. And so... The helper here is helping Peter as he's being filled with the Spirit uh, to address these men, uh, uh, what the source of his power is coming from. And so we see this in verse 8. 
Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is no salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so this, this helper, the Holy Spirit, gave Peter the words to say. The role, the role of the Holy Spirit, remember, is to bear witness to Jesus. And through Peter, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit did. Now, Peter could have tried to take the credit for, for this miraculous deed. But, but again, this happened in chapter 3. But in front of everybody, Peter proclaimed that the means by which he was able to do this was none other than Jesus. The Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, that Jesus, the one that they crucified, the one who raised from the dead. This is the source. This is the person who made this man well again. This is the person who made this crippled whole again. And so Peter continued to point people to Jesus by referring to a passage that they were all familiar with in Psalm 18, 118, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And so now that God has been unveiled, Peter sees the scripture through the lens of Jesus. He realizes that he's, this is making reference to Jesus, that Jesus is the stone that they rejected. They were the builders, and Jesus is that, that stone, that cornerstone that they rejected, but now has become the cornerstone nonetheless. You know, back in the day, you know, people you typically built their own homes, unlike, unlike today. Um, and the cornerstone was used as, as a foundation uh, and the standard bearer for where, where the rest of the house was built. And so the rest of the home would, would conform to the, the size and the angles of that cornerstone. And so the, you need to be careful about the cornerstone that you chose because that's what you built your home upon. But the builders rejected the real cornerstone. And yet this is the Lord's doing. That The psalmist affirms that this was, this was God's plan all along, and it was a marvelous plan. And so we've been saying throughout this Lenten season that it is Christ's rejection that is, that is the basis for our acceptance, which is the foundation which you could build your life upon. For most religions and worldviews, uh, life works like this. Uh, if you obey, then you'll be accepted. Uh, that's what we build our lives around, essentially. Sometimes, and sometimes as Christians, we operate uh, in this way too, uh, not realizing that, that that's not really what the gospel is. It's not, if I do enough, if I'm good enough, then, then I'll be accepted. Uh, that means everything kind of depends upon you, right? That means that it's all on you to, to do it. You're depending upon yourself, your own good works, however you define it, to earn some sort of favor before God or, or some, some other person. It reduces life to, am I enough? We're, we're constantly in this, this, this questioning ourselves of whether or not if, I, if you're good enough for God. But the good news of, of Easter is, is that you are accepted and loved, not on the basis of what you do, but on account of what Jesus has done. Our redemption bangs solely on his work and not ours. Any obedience on our part is not in order to try to gain favor or to win favor before God, but our any obedience on our part is is because out of joyful obedience because of what Christ has done for us. That as we begin to realize that it's our ba our basis of acceptance is not up to us. It's 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 because it, it's all because of what Jesus has done. Then it frees us. It frees us to live for Him, not to win favor for it from Him, but out of an expression of love and, and, and just thanksgiving for all that he's done for us. That is the basis for why we do good things. And so we do this through faith, that you trust in his work and not your own. And so when you have that, when you have that kind of acceptance, it, it's an a, a incredible uh, source of security. 
It's the kind of foundation that you want to build your life upon, knowing that you are accepted and loved by the only person that matters on account of what he did for us through Jesus Christ. Uh, that we don't have to be slaves to what other people think. We don't have to live for the approval of other people because we already have the approval that we need from the only person that matters. That it's, it's God, the Father, and through his Son, he was rejected so that you and I can be accepted. Now, Peter continues um, in, in verse, uh, verse 12, that there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. See, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you remember on Good Friday, uh, he kept on asking his father, is there any other way? Is there, I know what the plan is. I know what the plan is redemption. I know I came here to be a ransom for many, but is there any other way? And, and we, we, we saw that God's silence then at the garden and also at the cross when Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Basically, God's silence shows us that, no, there is no other way. This is the only way. This is the plan that his son will be rejected so that we may be accepted. That God's silence to Jesus' heartfelt cry tells us, no, this is the only way by which salvation can be had. It's through Jesus, his death, and his resurrection. This was the divine plan from the very beginning. And as the psalmist affirms, it is a marvelous plan. All other paths are, are dead end streets, but there's only one that leads to life. And that life is in his son through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters and friends, what are you building your life upon? What is the foundation of your life? Everybody has some sort of foundation. Everybody has something or someone in which they, they, they bank their lives upon. Everyone has a quote unquote cornerstone, that, which is what we measure or base our lives upon. And, and sometimes we kind of base our lives upon maybe how educated we are, how, how, what our reputation might be, how much wealth we have. Oftentimes our foundations, the things that bring us security are the things that are related to what we've accomplished, what we've worked so hard for. And I think perhaps that, especially in the times that we live in where there's so much insecurity and so much scarcity, that, 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 that it's amazing how something so little can cause cracks in, in the foundations that we've laid. Foundations we thought were impenetrable, foundations we thought could never be lost or crumble before us. but maybe our lifetime of, of hard work to some effort to have some level of control and security now is it's kind of crumbling before our eyes and so maybe you're kind of at a place where you're beginning to see that that the, that the foundations of your life the things that you place your your worth in maybe it's not it wasn't as strong as you thought it was and maybe today is is the day where perhaps you can be, begin anew and and there's nothing more Easter-ish than, than leaving behind our old life and to pursue a, a new kind of life where we embrace all of who Christ is, to embrace this new life that he has for us, that he offers to us. And so it does mean transferring your trust from your faulty foundations and to instead transfer that trust and to build your life upon the only cornerstone that can withstand the weight and everything that life throws upon it, that there's nothing that could, that could that bring down this, this, this foundation that is in Jesus Christ. Jesus was rejected so that you may be accepted. So will you take that step of faith? Will you believe in who Jesus is and what he's done for you? When, when you place your faith in him, when you let him be the basis of your acceptance, it frees us to live our lives for him in a way that you never thought or could never imagine. No matter what kinds of things would happen in this life, whether it be suffering, hardship, and yes, a pandemic, we have a foundation that is secure and a hope that is real. When we rely on Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, there, there's nothing that can stop what God wants to do in your life. There's nothing that can contain the Spirit's work in and through us. Um, during these challenging um, and dark moments, um, maybe it's God shaking up our world a bit. Maybe, and, and as 
the world is being shook as life is turned upside down. Uh, there's a bubbling up that uh, there's a kind of bubbling up that is the not so good kind of bubbling up. As we've, we've seen um, around us, maybe even in us, that what bubbles up when things get shook, get, get shaken, is sometimes ugly things get come out, right? Sometimes hatred spews out. Sometimes selfishness spews out. And and it's it's yeah. Sometimes when you shake things, it, it brings out people's worse. And and if you you and I are honest, sometimes it does that for us as well. That we've had some. Perhaps I know for myself, not so pleasant moments where certain things come out that that ugliness that comes out of, out of us. But perhaps maybe this is also a moment in history where God wants to shake up the church a bit. Uh, maybe we're kind of like flat soda that's just been kind of sitting around kind of lifeless, right? With no pop, with no energy. And maybe God is, is shaking up the church a little bit. It, 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 it's uncomfortable for sure because nobody wants their lives to be shook up. Nobody wants their lives to be shaken upside down. And, and yet, if we're open and perhaps attentive to the ways in which God wants to reorder our lives and for us to even reimagine our lives to be seen in a different way through the lens of Jesus Christ and the building of his kingdom, uh, perhaps this shakeup is exactly what we need. God maybe wants to shake up your life so that you and I can experience the joy of the resurrection, that that joy of the resurrection will bubble up out of us and to spill out into the world for the good of the world and for the glory of God. You know, I've heard many stories and testimonies from, from you and New Community of how you are connecting in, in new and, and deeper ways that, that, um, that you've never experienced before. Uh, there are people that you haven't talked to in years. There are family members that you are talking to on a regular basis now because of everybody's um, kind of sense of vulnerability and need for connection. Uh, recently, I connected with somebody myself um, who I hadn't seen in a long time, a friend of mine from years past. And recently, he posted something that kind of made me sad and where he uh, basically said that he no longer was a follower of Jesus. And I, in some ways, I wasn't incredibly surprised, but just to kind of see it in writing uh, was, was, was kind of sad for me. And, and there was kind of a moment where I like, well, should I, should I DM him and, and kind of check in with him? But I kind of wrestled with that because it's not something I typically do. I don't really respond to people on social media, especially people I haven't seen in a long time. But I decided to kind of give it a shot and, and see what would happen. And I just kind of DM'd him and said, hey, listen, um, you know, long time no talk. And it seems like a lot of things going on in your lives that things have changed quite a bit. And, and if you're up for it, I'd love to kind of hear where your journey has taken you. And, you know, just trying to create an opening just for conversation. It's not, you know, hey, how come you're not a Christian anymore? What happened? And none of that. Just just trying to have a posture of listening. And 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 you know, surprise, to my surprise, he, he answered and he said, yeah, normally when people uh, ask me about this, I, I usually ref kind of decline a conversation like that but but with you I, I'm comfortable and so we're actually talking uh, tonight at nine o'clock and so if you would actually pray for me and 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 that that conversation would be be hopefully um, helpful for him and uh, not so much on what I say or, or my wisdom but but just to have a posture of listening and and to wait upon the Holy Spirit to see if he would have anything uh, to, to say through me but again um, as we think about these times, I have a feeling in these times of social distancing where we feel isolated, where the news it just feels especially heavy, where we're being impacted in so many different ways, um, maybe people are more con open to connecting in ways that perhaps uh, wouldn't have, they wouldn't be open to, um, you know, two months ago, right? And and to just have the opportunity to listen to each other, to catch up, to lament, just all that's going on in the world. Um, to, to believe that, that the Holy Spirit is in all these conversations, perhaps pointing people to uh, the hope of the resurrection in the midst of this dark and, and world that, is, is, that just feels really, really heavy. Yes, it's scary to put yourself out there. Uh, sometimes we play mind tricks with ourselves. Sometimes we even put a cap on it ourselves in terms of a cap on the Holy Spirit where we, we just 
don't want to spill out. We don't want to make a mess, and we're afraid of the mess, and so we, we try to put a cap on it, right? And 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 but I just want us to be encouraged. Uh, in, uh, verse thirteen, um, uh, P- Peter, uh, uh, not Peter, but the the uh, the chief priests, and as they're kind of observing Peter uh, saying all these different things. Uh, here's what he says. And now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated common men, and they were astonished. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. And, and that's a, of great encouragement to me, because in the end, as people were observing this Peter being bold and courageous, uh, they noticed that, you know what, these are unschooled, they're ordinary people. You know, there's nothing special about them. And But what stood out to them was that this Peter had been with Jesus. And when the watching world was looking at Peter, again, they knew it had nothing to do with his intellect, it had nothing to do with what he knew, but it had everything to do with who he spent time with, who he knew intimately and deeply, and that was Jesus. So brothers and sisters, as we think about our lives, as we think about life in the here and now, in these strange times that we live in, let's be with Jesus. Let's spend time with him. Let's be empowered by the Holy Spirit and see where he leads and, and let it bubble up within us. And, and let's see what God might do in and through us and through our church. God might surprise us, even though there are so many constraints and limits seemingly all around us. Maybe God is unleashing us to do something different, something that we could never imagined before, something in which uh, God would receive the glory. And so let's pursue that. Let us pray. Father, we uh, come before you acknowledging uh, that we don't like uh, being shaken up. Uh, Oftentimes, we are comfortable with where we are. But Lord, for our good and for the good of the world, you maybe you're shaking up the church, Lord. Maybe you're shaking up the world, Lord, to perhaps pay attention to, to you and to what you're doing. And so, Father, these are uh, really challenging and difficult times for many. But, Lord, would you give us uh, a measure of hope, Lord, a hope in the resurrection, the hope that you are alive, that you are with us, that you desire to be with us, Lord. And, Lord, help us to just to spend time with you, to believe that you are in our midst and that you want to tell us something, that you want to do something, that you want to uh, give us eyes to see new and creative ways in which you want us to live our lives uh, during these times. And so, Father, we uh, desire to be open to that, and, and we pray that you would be magnified and you'd be glorified even through uh, these challenging moments in which we face. And so, Lord, we offer ourselves to you. Fill us. Uh, let your spirit bubble us, bubble up inside so that we may uh, pour out our lives uh, to a world that is hurting, to a world that desperately needs you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now it's time for response, and there's a few ways we're going to do that. First is just to offer ourselves to God, including our tithes and offerings. Uh, there are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, we could do it online. We could do it through texting. Uh, there's more information below. Uh, there's a PO box number as well. So uh, if you are in, in a position to be able to uh, give, we, we encourage you to do so, especially as we think of those brothers and sisters who, who might be hurting during these, this economic downfall. And we encourage you to reach out to the pastoral staff, including myself. If you find yourself in a really challenging uh, season in your life, maybe you've gotten laid off or you're on furloughed and, and things are just really tight and really difficult, I encourage you to talk, to talk to me. I'd love to talk to you, counsel you, pray with you, and see um, if a charity fund would be a, a good place for you to uh, perhaps tap into. And so uh, talk to me. And again, uh, for those of you who might be, who are in, perhaps in, in better position uh, to, to give, uh, that, that perhaps you would also consider giving to the charity fund during this season. We all, we're also supporting the work of the Boston Resiliency Fund, and so uh, this Sunday is the last, today is the last Sunday in which you can give towards that, and so we would encourage you uh, to do that as well. And so um, as we consider just all that Christ has done for us, let us offer ourselves to the Lord. Uh, our whole lives, all of, all of who we are, all that we have, that we would uh, give uh, to Jesus Christ. And so Saul's going to lead us in our closing song, and let us just continue to worship and to just remember what a beautiful name uh, Jesus is, and that we would uh, call out to him during these times.
Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. Veil tore before you, silence the boast of sin and grave. Heavens are roaring, praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal now and forever, God. You reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining us on this uh, Easter Sunday and to be a part of this experience that we get to have together. Uh, we hope that you stick around uh, afterwards for our Zoom gathering. It's an opportunity for us to connect and reconnect. And if you're new with us, we, we, we also encourage you to come and join us and, and give us a chance to get to know you and, and for you to get to know us. At 12 o'clock, there is kind of a, a special surprise. Uh, I depends on if the technology will work, but, but uh, we have something, uh, so, something special in store for you. So we hope that you stick around and join us on Zoom and you get to check out what that's all about. So, uh, but as you leave this place, as you uh, log off and as you kind of, uh, as we go our separate ways, um, let's be reminded that Christ is risen and he's risen indeed. And the Holy Spirit is, is among us and he's, he's bubbling up inside. And as, as God is shaking 
shaking the world up. May we, like uh, salt and salt shaker, be, be spread out into the world to show the world what, what the world looks like when, when Jesus is, is in charge and when Jesus is alive. So uh, may the spirit bubble up within you and may you spill out into the, for the good of the world and for the glory of God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always and all God's people say, Amen. Happy Easter. God bless you. And we hope to see you next week.